Welcome friends, we continue with the second episode of the Sanctuary Message. When we read the book of Psalms chapter 77, let's begin with Psalms 77 verse 13. The Bible tells us the following. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God like our God? Which way is the Bible talking about? Remember in our previous discussion, we discovered that man strayed away from the path of righteousness, from the path of holiness, from the, from, from the way of eternal life. He ceased to live eternally. He started dying. Now the Lord had to institute a way or had to you know, bring into effect a way through which man would walk and go back to God go back to eternal life, go back to holiness. And this is the way that David in the book of Psalms 77 verse 13, he is talking about thy way of God is in the sanctuary. What is the sanctuary? We will come to that. For now, let us focus on the way. Which one is this way? How shall we know that we are walking in the way that is leading us to eternal life. How shall we know? Let us go to the book of John chapter 14 verse 6. The book of John chapter 14 verse 6 tells us the following words. The Bible says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me, thy way, O Lord, is in the subject. And Jesus Christ says he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way which leads to eternal life. He is the truth that if someone believes in this truth, would make him wise unto salvation. And Jesus Christ says he is the life, he is eternal life himself. Because there is no one who can live eternally without God permitting them to live eternally. Jesus Christ is the life. And if you want to live eternally, then Jesus Christ is the answer to your questions. Jesus Christ is the answer to your expedition. He says he's the life. He says he's the way, he's the truth. So Jesus Christ is the way which is, is, which is in the sanctuary. When the Bible says, Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary, then Jesus Christ must be in the sanctuary. That is why there is a way in the sanctuary, which must lead people to what? To eternal life. We shall see how Jesus Christ fits exactly in the sanctuary. And this, friends, I need to mention this. We need... We need, we need to follow, you need to follow keenly, you need to follow closely as we begin, you know, to dig deeper into the sanctuary message. Because this is the only message, this is one of the messages that differentiates Seventh-day Adventist Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church from other churches. Other churches can talk about Jesus Christ, can talk about this, this and that, but they do not talk about the sanctuary message. And if you do not know as a Seventh-day Adventist member, if you do not know the sanctuary message, then maybe you have not started the journey in your Adventism. You are just at the beginning of your journey. You have not started walking. Christ is, in the, is the way which is in the sanctuary. How is Jesus Christ in the sanctuary, we shall discover in a few moments. Let us go back because there is a question that we need to ask. What then is the sanctuary? 
What then is the sanctuary? Let us go to the book of Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25. Reading from this one. The Bible tells us the following. Exodus chapter 25. The Bible tells us the following. We will read from verse 1. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver, and the brass, and the blue, and the purple, and the scarlet, and the fine linen, and the goat's hair, and the ram's skins dyed red, and the badger's skins, and the shitting wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing, for anointing oil, and the sweet incense. Verse 7, onyx stones, and the stones to be set in the in the ephod, and in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary. Verse 8, let's read verse 8, and let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. Let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. Remember, friends, in our previous episode, we discovered that the Lord used to commune on a daily basis with the children of Israel. Twice a day, in the morning, God visited them. In the evening, the Lord visited them. And this, in, during one of his visitations to the Holy Pair, the Lord discovered that when he went in the garden, he did not find them where they were supposed to be found. He called out, Adam, Adam, where are you? And then Adam said, my Lord, I am hiding. Why are you hiding? I am naked. Who told you you are naked? This woman. We hear that. That was coming from the Lord's visitation. So God used to you know, visit them on a daily basis. And God's idea or God's desire, God's design is that he should always be with his people. Right? God's desire is that he should always be with you. He should always be with me. So God's desire is to be with man always. But what makes God leave man? Or what, or what makes man leave God? What stands in between man and God? What separates man and God? It is what? It is sin. It is sin. We find when Adam and Eve sinned, the Lord sent them out of the garden where they used to meet. So that, so that meeting, that communion, became to an end. There was a separation. Even now, when we are communing with God, if sin is introduced in our relationship with God, then God will cease to commune with us. Then there is going to be separation. There is going to be an hindrance in between. Sin became an hindrance between Adam and Eve and God. But God never designed that there should be something that should stand in between God and man. That's why Jesus Christ had to come and stand, remove sin from in between man and God so that he can stand in between man and God. We shall see these things as we go on. So God's design is that he should be with man always. And he tells the children of Israel, when they left the land of Egypt, they were at, Ken, at, at Mount Sinai. The Lord gave instructions to Moses. He told them, he told him, God told the children of Israel to make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. So the sanctuary is a dwelling place. The sanctuary is a temple, is a place where we find the presence of God. This is the place where we find the presence of God. Are we together, friends? So God has always wanted to be with who? With man. We shall continue discovering these facts, these important facts. Because even when Jesus Christ came upon the earth, the Bible in the book of 
in the book of in the book of Isaiah, the Bible tells us he shall be born. His name shall be called what? Shall be Emmanuel. What is what does what does, what does the, the name Emmanuel means? It means God with us. God's desire is always to be with what? With his people. And Jesus Christ, when he left this earth, he left us with a promise. John chapter 14, verse 1 to verse 3. Let, on, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will do what? I will come again and receive you unto myself. So that where I am, there ye may be also. So God's desire is always to be with his people, his creation. He continue, He longs continually to, you know, to live with us. But what goes wrong? It is when we introduce sin in our lives. We introduce sin in our relationship, in our relationship with God. Then there are changes that follow in that relationship. So, the children of Israel were told, make a sanctuary. This sanctuary was made. Now, before the sanctuary was made, the Lord commanded the children of Israel, when making this sanctuary, the material that must be used, you must use gold, you must use silver, you must use brass you must use the you know the uh, you must use the blue clothing then there must be purple there must be scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and the ram's skins dyed red and badger's skins and the sheeting wood then there is oil for the anointing and oil you know for the light and the sweet incense and for sweet incense we have the stones, onyx stones, stones for the breastplate. These are the materials that, you, that, that were used to do what? To construct the sanctuary. Why did God labor so much? Why did God labor so much? Why didn't he just tell them, go and make me a sanctuary? It does not matter how you make it. You can make it in, in any shape, in any form. You can use whatever materials you, can, you, you want to use. But he went on. He did not just tell them the material that, that they were supposed to use. If we read on down the chapter, we find that the Lord went on to give each and every specification, each and every article in the sanctuary, as we shall discover. It had measurements which were prescribed by the Lord. The Lord told them this should be this long, it should be this wide, it's, it should be this high. He went to those. Why did God labor so much to tell human beings, to tell Moses and the children of Israel how the sanctuary was supposed to, 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 you know, to be made in each and every specification? Why? It is only God who knows how we must be saved. He cannot leave the plan of redemption. The plan of redemption cannot be left to be designed by man. It is God who knows sin. It is God who understands how sin can be eliminated. So, the same way he designed the plan of redemption, he should be able to tell you and me exactly how we must be saved if we want to be saved. Now we have a problem in the world where people want to do what they, they, you know, what they desire or what their hearts tell them to do without taking into consideration what the instruction of the Lord are. People want to do whatever they, they please. They don't want to consult God. They think by doing what they, that they are doing, then they are going to be accepted. Many say, the Lord does not mind what I do, how I dress, how I do this and this. The Lord looks at the heart. But we find that if you must be saved, then you must keenly listen to the instructions of the Lord. Because He alone 
knows what you must do and what you must not do, what you must follow and what you must not follow. He is the way which leads to what? To eternal life. It is not you to, 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 to command God what you must do for you to be saved. It is God who is giving you salvation who must tell you what you, what, what you must do for you to be saved. That's why God labored so much to tell Moses, to instruct Moses in every specification how the sun time was supposed to be made. So, these materials that were supposed to be used, each of them, that's why God even gave them the colors. You must only use four colors, white, blue, scarlet, and purple. All these colors have got meanings, and these meanings are attached to, are attached to salvation. Attached to salvation. The gold, the silver, and the brass attached to salvation. The onyx stones, the you know, stones for the breastplate, they are attached to salvation. So we shall go now into discovering what these articles meant. Then we shall come to the construction of the sanctuary. Let us first understand what the meaning of these articles were. Or what the meaning of these articles are. Shall we read? We shall begin with, with, with the God. With the God. What does God mean in the sanctuary? What does it mean? When we read the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 19, verse 8 to verse 10, the Bible tells us the following. Psalms 19, the Bible tells us the following. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be, de more to be desired are they than God, yea, than much fine God, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Let's, let us also consider the book of Isaiah, chapter, chapter 13, verse 12. The Bible tells us the following. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, Thirteen, verse twelve. The Bible says, "I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even an, even a man than the golden weight over offer." This God in the sanctuary meant the perfection of character. The perfection of character. That is what God means. That's when. We, that's why we find in the book of Revelation, chapter three. When we read verse 18, Christ bids us, bids you and me, I, I counsel thee to buy of me God tried in the fire. That is the pure character, the perfected character of Christ. And then we go to silver. What does silver mean? We read the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 to 19. And we can also read the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 6 and the book of Kings. When we read these verses, we find that silver is a symbol of the price that was paid by Jesus Christ by shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary so that you can be saved. This is the price that was paid. It is a symbol of the price. That Christ paid for the redemption of man. How else do we know this? We can know it. Judah, when Judah sold Jesus Christ, what did what, what, what was he given? He was given 30 pieces of 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver were given to him. So silver is a, is a representation of the price paid on Calvary. To redeem man and what does 
Brass mean? Brass is a symbol of humanity. Jesus Christ, being God, came down to become a human being. And then the two personalities, the divine and the, you know, the human, combined together. Jesus Christ was 100% God and he was 100% man. The two combined to become one. Because God, or let me say, God in his, in his nature, if Jesus Christ had, had come as, as God in his nature, it was, going to be, it was not going to be possible for him to die and, you know, redeem man. So he had to come and be like one of us and live like one of us and go through the same life, you know, that we live upon this earth then he was going to be able to be the perfect the perfect you know you know a a a lamb that was going to be to be to be to die in our place he could not die as god he has to die as man because man is the one who had fallen so he had to come to you know to the level of man and be like man then redeem man through the flesh of humanity that is the brass. Let us go on. We come to the, the remnant that was used. We find four colors. The first color we find is blue. What does blue symbolize? Blue symbolizes obedience to the commandments of God. When we read the book over, let's read this one. Let's read, brothers. When we read the book of Numbers chapter 15, verse 37, verse 38, the Bible has this to follow, has, has the following to say. Numbers chapter 15, the Bible tells us the following. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. And that they put upon the fringes of the borders a ribbon of blue, a ribbon of blue, and in and it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them, and that ye seek not after after your own heart and your own eyes. After which ye used to go a whoring. So this is the meaning of blue. Blue symbolizes obedience to the commandments of God. Which commandments are they? It is the Ten Commandments. It is the Ten Commandments. Others have distorted this meaning by saying blue is is uh, uh, blue is for love. I've heard such kind of comments. Blue, according to the commandments, according to the Bible, it represents obedience, obedience to the law, or to the law of God. And then we are told there was also to be the color purple. Purple. When we read the book of John, chapter nineteen, verse one to five, John chapter nineteen, verse five, we find that. Purple is a is a representation of royalty. Is a representation of, of of loyalty, not royalty, but loyalty. It, it uh, this color is uh, is associated with uh, with uh, with king queen, with kingship. That's why Jesus Christ when he when he was taken to to Pilate, he was uh, you know. Uh, when he was taken to Herod, he was uh, a, 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 a purple, a purple, a purple coat was put, placed on, on him, and a crown of thorns upon his brow. They started mocking him, "Hail, King of the Jews! Hail, King of the Jews!" That is a symbol that Jesus Christ is a king. But people did not understand that actually, through their mockings, they were confirming that Jesus Christ was the king. So this color is associated with kingship. Then we come to scarlet. 
What does scarlet mean? Scarlet, when we read the book of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, Come, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be like, like snow. They shall be like who? Though they be red like, like, like crimson, they shall be like what? Like snow. That is what the Bible says. And this color, scarlet, is a symbol of sin. It is a symbol of sin. What else do we have? We have, a, you know, the linen. Fine linen. Fine linen, it is a, a white color. It's a white color. What does this mean? Or what does it symbolize? The white color symbolizes what we find in the book of Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. The Bible says the following. On Revelation chapter 19, the Bible tells us the following. Verse 7, the Bible says, Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made, us, hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So this, friends, we shall end on this note. We shall end on this note. Fine linen is a symbol of the righteousness of the saints. Remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, they went and sewed fig leaves and covered themselves. This covering of themselves with the leaves is a symbol of self-righteousness. They wanted to make a, sol a solution, a personal solution to their sin. But according to what God had planned, it is not man to bring himself back to the favor or in the favor of the Lord. Man was supposed to be brought back in the favor of the Lord by the plan of God through the plan of redemption. Now, when man sinned, he went and put a covering upon his nakedness, his nakedness, which is self-righteousness. And as we are told in the book of Isaiah chapter 60, 64, verse 6, our righteousness, our righteousnesses are like filth, what? Filth rags. How long can the fig leaves go? How long can they stay on the body? Because as soon or no sooner the sun is risen, than they, you know, than they dry up and begin to fall off from the body. So Jesus Christ had to provide, a, let me say the Lord had to provide a way. He killed a lamb and got the skins and put them on which is the righteousness in the imparted righteousness, the righteousness which God himself puts on us. So this fine linen is a representation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ through which every one of us is going to be saved. That's why Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Brother, sister, if you do not believe in the name of Jesus Christ, if you do not believe Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are putting on self-righteousness, which shall not lead you to salvation. Only when you, when you come to Jesus Christ and he, he puts on you, he covers you with his own righteousness, then shall you be saved. Shall you be saved, friend? This is the great message. These are the important truths that have been hidden in the sanctuary. That's why we are told, among us the present truth messages that we are supposed to preach in these last days is the sanctuary message. People need to understand what the sanctuary message is or what the sanctuary message means to them. We shall close on this note. We shall close on this note, friends. Let us read from Let us read from the book of Great Controversy. Great Controversy. Let us read. We hear what the Bible or what the Spirit of Prophecy 
encourages us to do. Concerning the center message. We are told on page 488, paragraph 2 and paragraph 3, we are told, those who should share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to, perf to perfect holiness in the fear of God. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, to display, to gain seeking, should be devoted to an earnest prayerful study of the word of truth. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Every individual has a soul to save or a soul to lose. Each has a cash spending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge face to face. How important then that every mind contemplate upon the solemn scene when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened. When, with Daniel, every individual must stand in his lot at the end of days, at the end of the days. Then we are told, all who receive the light upon these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. The sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of men. It concerns every soul living upon the earth. It opens to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest, of the contest between righteousness and sin. It is of the utmost importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer to everyone that asketh them a reason of the hope that is in them. Friends, we must understand the sanctuary message, especially in these last days. We are living in the solemn times, the closing hours of this earth's history. Soon probation shall close. How shall you stand in that great day? How shall you stand if you are putting on the covering of self-righteousness? How shall you stand if you have rejected Jesus Christ, who alone is the way, is the truth, and he is the life? That answer must be answered, or that question must be answered individually by everyone who comes across this message. May the Lord God bless you. Brothers, we shall continue. By God's grace, we shall continue until we finish this great subject. God bless you.